Hi and welcome back. Probably the most common question that we get asked is, if I want to move to the country, if I want to live the good life, what should I be looking for in a property? Well today we're going to look to answer that question. Hi, my name's Hugh. And my name's Fiona. Welcome to English Country Life and welcome to our beautiful home. This is part two of our series, Starting a Small Holding. And in this episode, we'd like to start you on the journey to finding your countryside dream property. When you live in a town, a lot of your day-to-day -day activities take place away from the home. Sure, you sleep at home, you have your tea there, you watch a bit of TV. But if you go out for food, whether it's to buy it or to eat it out, that's away from the home. When you go to work, that's away from the home. A lot of the time when you see friends, it's at a theatre or a show or a pub and it's away from home. When you live in the country, that can be very different. You get up in the morning, you see to your land, you tend to your livestock, you work on your vegetables and your crops. Maybe you make a bit of bacon or brew a bit of beer. And if you're lucky, a friend will come around in the evening and you'll share some of that food and drink. Now, when we started looking for our countryside dream, we recognised these differences. And what we'd like to do is walk you through some of the choices that we made. We will look at, first of all, lifestyle choices, and we will talk you through the options that we considered. We'll then talk you through how much land might be required. And this is a question we get asked a lot. How much land do I need? So we'll give you some choices and show you what's possible. Then we'll talk you through the outbuildings that will be needed at a country property to support that lifestyle that you've chosen. So all of these things we're going to look at today are the things which are different to the urban properties or city properties that you might be looking at. So let's get started with lifestyle. When we decided to move to the country, there were a number of models that we considered because we realised that no one moves to the countryside to get rich. We move to make ourselves happy and we believe most people do that to follow their dream too. There were three models that we considered. There's the farming model and the idea with the farm is that you're covering all of your bills. So you're growing enough livestock or you're growing enough crops to sell them outside of the property and bring in enough money to cover every single bill that you see. The next model we considered was a small holding self-sufficient model, which is clearly the one that we chose and it's the subject of all of these videos. With this model, you are growing food to eat to support yourself in that way, but you're not actually generating enough to bring in enough income that you cover all of your bills. So you still need to work outside of the property. The third model that we considered was living in the country, just in a country house with a larger garden. And we'd carry on working in the towns or the cities, or maybe even move our employment to the countryside. Every one of those three models is a valid model and would work very well for a lot of people. We chose the middle one, but it may be that you choose farming or just simply moving to the countryside. So, once you've chosen your model, and as Fiona says, we chose the self-sufficient, self-supporting smallholder lifestyle. And in effect, we wanted to produce most of our own food, most of the things we need. And we work occasionally to pay for things like council tax, which is a land tax in the UK, to pay for electricity bills and those kind of external financial obligations that we have. But we also need to acknowledge that there are three kinds of constraints that we had to look at when we chose the property that was right for us. And the first constraint is money. Not just what sort of a property could we afford to buy, but also how are we gonna pay for those kind of bills in the future going forward? So on the basis that we might need to work occasionally, we decided we didn't wanna live somewhere that was so far away, we couldn't even get home at weekends if we took on an external contract. And that constraint narrow down our choices. A second constraint that most people need to think about is location. Have you got family? Have you got friends that you want to see regularly? And if so, where do you want your property to be in order that you can get to see them? The third kind of constraint can be services. 
If you want to work from home, I've been lucky enough to do that for the last six months. I can only do that because we've got good broadband at this property. And a lot of rural properties don't have that. We've had other friends who've got teenage kids and those kids wanted to go and see their friends. And they were lucky enough to be on a public transport network but a lot of rural properties aren't. So these are the sorts of things you need to check out to make sure that the properties you're looking at meet with your lifestyle and your family. Now we fully appreciate these constraints can feel overwhelming, including money. And it's one of the main reasons most people give up on their rural dreams. But we're gonna make this a subject of our next video and deal with it in a lot more detail. And what we're hoping to do is give you some flexible options so you can possibly think about the issues in a slightly different way and widen your choices so you can get that rural dream. We're also going to do a further video focusing on the house itself and give you a model and a tool that we use to help you narrow down your selection. So actually you can tick some off before you've even wasted your time in viewing them if they're not going to meet your criteria. So on the assumption that, like us, you're going to go for a self-sufficient small holding type operation. One of the biggest questions that you'll always come up against is, how much land do I need? Well, depends on the life you want to live. If you just want a few chickens and a vegetable garden, that's one size of property. If you want to be entirely self-sufficient in milk and cheese and dairy and beef and pork and lamb and fish and firewood, that's a different type of property. And in the next segment, what I'm gonna do is go through each of these types of things that you might choose to do and how much land you might need to put to it. And that way you can use a sort of mix and match approach, look at the different parts of that choices that you might want for your family and your lifestyle, put them together and decide on the size of property that you need. To show the amount of land that different activities in small holding and self-reliance need, I want to build up a picture. We can start with a little cottage, our cottage, and we're going to put various pieces of land around it to undertake the various activities. Now, I've got to make assumptions to do that. So the assumptions I'm choosing to make here are the land is good quality, reasonably level, reasonably fertile, reasonably well drained. So quality farmland. If I'm saying two animals per acre, that means two animals per acre on that type of land, not on a steep, rugged, rocky hillside. Of course you can rough graze animals, but generally you're gonna need considerably more land to do it. So let's take a look, build up our small holding, assuming that we've got flat level fertile land. I think for most of us, a veg garden is a good basic place to start on a self-reliant small holding journey. And for me, a really good veg garden for a family wants to be up to a quarter of an acre. A lot of people I know don't understand acres these days, so a quarter of an acre is a thousand square meters. Or think of it another way, a hundred foot by a hundred foot plot. For those of us in the UK, that's four full size allotments. To some that may sound a lot, to some that may sound a little, but a thousand square meters done with hand tools is probably as much as you're realistically going to want to manage. And it should be able to provide all the root vegetables, all the leafy vegetables, the cabbages, the brassicas, the cauliflowers, the lettuces. It can also provide enough soft fruits. So strawberries, raspberries, currants, gooseberries, etc., for a good sized family. If we move from a quarter acre plot to a half acre plot, I would add an orchard. An orchard would provide all the apples, pears, plums, cherries that a family would need. And because the orchard's up in the air, you could also run a decent amount of poultry underneath it. On a quarter acre plot, you could easily run 20 chickens all the year round, and far more than that in the spring and summer in the prime breeding season. If we add another quarter of an acre, so that's three quarters of an acre in total, we could easily have a couple of pigs. Now a quarter of an acre isn't enough for a full breeding program for pigs, but you could buy in a couple of wieners, fatten them up, bring them on, and provide a great deal of pork for your family on a quarter of an acre. I wouldn't advise just raising one because pigs are social animals, as most animals are, and prefer really to be in groups. 
If we add another quarter acre, that brings us up to a total of one acre, you could easily run a couple of sheep in a pallet. Now, I'm not particularly saying that two sheep is the right number. I'm trying to give an idea of stocking density. Two sheep would certainly, again, provide a great deal of lamb if you brought them on. But you may also want a slightly larger flock to use the wool and maybe even to have a small breeding flock. But what you understand now is eight per acre on good quality land, probably a reasonable density. I'm going to shrink down a little bit now just to give us more room to work. Let's take another acre. So give us a two acre total. One acre could provide all the wheat you need for your family's bread and some grain for your poultry. It would also provide a lot of straw for all your livestock bedding. Alternatively, you could do half wheat, half potatoes. What we're looking at here is the amount of land you need to provide the base carbohydrates for your family's diet. If we add another couple of acres to a four acre total small holding, we'd have room for a family milk cow, for all our milk, for our butter, for our cheese. Now actually, one cow, certainly the modern dairy breeds, would give far more milk than we would ever need as a single family. So often, a cow with a calf at foot is a good way to go on the small holding. And one of the smaller utility breeds, like Dexter's or Jersey's, which give a very high cream milk. Why have a calf at foot? Well, cows have to be bred regularly to keep them in milk. But also, if you've got a calf, you've either got a replacement for your milker as it grows, or a male cow, which provide a good source of beef and another kind of meat for your family to enjoy. If I was able to add another four acres, I would add coppiced woodland because that gives me fuel. That's a heat source, that's a cooking source, but it also gives me timber. And with that timber, I've got bean poles and I've got wood to make chicken coops and I can be a lot more self-sufficient. And in a four acre wood, I would put a pond. Why? Well, in that pond, just let's say it's a 10 meter by 10 meter pond, that would provide a considerable amount of fish to add to the diet variation of the family. Years ago, monasteries and bigger houses often had carp ponds and other forms of fish pond to provide fresh fish when they were a long way from the sea. But when you've got a pond, you can add ducks. And ducks are another source of meat, another source of eggs. And also in your woodland, you can add more pigs. Pigs are woodland animals. They love living in woodland and you've got a lot more space there than the quarter acre for a couple of wieners. If I had two more acres, I'd use those acres to grow fodder, to get my livestock through the winter and to allow for some crop rotation, some fallow ground to rest the soil so I wasn't working the land quite so intensively. That would take us up to a 10 acre total and that's as much as I would want to work with reasonable manual tools. And if I went much more than that, honestly, I'd be moving into a commercial operation where I'd be raising animals and crops to sell rather than to sustain the family. Now, we haven't got 10 acres right now. I wish we did have, and I'd love to do all the things I've illustrated. But there's always compromises to be made. And honestly, you might not want to have sheep, but you might want more pigs. You might not want to grow wheat, but you might prefer to have more cattle. You might only have one acre of coppice woodland and decide that's all you want to manage. I'm not saying that all of these things have to be all of these sizes. What I'm trying to illustrate is, in my head, if I wanted a perfect self-sufficient small holding, this is the sort of land that I would allow, but it's perfectly viable as we do now to have less than that and only do some of the activities. One of the things that's really surprising when you start living a small home life is how much outside building space you need that isn't part of your home. Definitely more square footage and outbuildings than your house itself. And that I'm encouraging you to think about and understand so you can get the right property for you. I'm going to break it down into kind of four types, really, that you want to think about. You're going to want to think about implement storage. You're going to want to think about animal housing. You're going to want to think about storing, feed and bedding. You're going to want to think about workshops. So let's look briefly at those. And we can talk about some other subtypes of those as well. This is the first one. This is an implement store. This is our tool store. 
And in here we keep chainsaws and hedge cutters and mowers and rotivators and brush cutters and chippers and log splitters and pumps and all those other bits of equipment we need to run the small holding. And this is really small scale stuff. Imagine if you were running a big farm, you'd have tractors and tractor implements and quad bikes and combine harvesters and hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of really heavy plant that needs looking after, protecting from theft, protecting from the elements. But as a smallholder, you might have other kinds of equipment you need to store that big commercial operations don't worry about. We preserve our own food. So all that food preservation equipment, plus all the jars and bottles, all of that needs to be stored, both the empty stuff and the stuff that we've filled ready for the winter. And that can take up a lot of space, as can many of the other self-sufficient types of activity. Then you've got your animals, and all animals are going to require some measure of housing, most likely. So whether that is a coop for your chickens or an enormous cow buyer for a thousand cows, you're going to need somewhere to get your animals out of the elements, maybe just for the winter, maybe all the year round. But you really need to think about, do the outbuildings that are at the property I'm looking at suit the kind of lifestyle that I want to live? If I want to raise pigs, are there pig arcs? Are there pig styes? Is that all ready for me? And while we're on the subject of animals, you need to think about bedding and food for those animals. If you're going to be cutting your own hay, if you're going to be making silage, if you're going to be storing straw from your wheat, you need somewhere to put all of that. And if you've driven past farms, you've probably seen those enormous barn type structures stacked full of straw, stacked full of hay, because you get through an awful lot of it if you're running through livestock. So that's three of them. That's implement stores, animal housing, housing for feed and bedding. You're also going to want some kinds of workshops and probably two types. If you're going to be maintaining all your own equipment, you're going to want some sort of place to put your welders and your spanners and your socket sets. You might want an inspection pit, a small garage almost to maintain your farm equipment. And if you're going to be doing all your own carpentry and making chicken coops and pig arcs and all of that kind of stuff, maintaining the environment, making fence posts, you're going to want some carpentry type equipment. So you're going to want somebody to put your table saw and your chop saw and your drill press and your bandsaw and all of that other gear. Now that could be one big workshop, it could be two smaller workshops, but you're definitely going to need somewhere both to store that equipment and to do the work. And the last thing you might need is specialist equipment. If you're going to heat with wood, where are you going to keep all your wood dry and away from the elements? Now, you can improvise something or you can build really good quality log stores to do that kind of work. And again, if you're heating only with wood, you'll be surprised how much wood you go through in a year. So let's go and take a look at some of those examples. This is winter bedding just for the chickens. Now, it is a few months worth but you get a much better price and you can get it delivered if you buy it in bulk. So it's not like having a family pet where you nip to Sainsbury's every week for a tin of pet food. For your feed and for your bedding, you're generally gonna either buy in bulk or make in bulk because if you're producing your own straw, you're only gonna cut that once a year. Same for hay, maybe twice a year for hay. But you need good, sizable, dry stores for the livestock that you're gonna keep and for their bedding and food needs. This is another type of store area that we need. It's a racked area and we use it for keeping in our canning jars, our homebrew bottles, and also the large bulky homebrew equipment, canning equipment that we need for our self-reliant life. If you're planning on a self-sufficient lifestyle, allow yourself plenty of room to store the food that you preserve. You're gonna need far more space than a normal domestic pantry. And many houses don't even have that. That was part two of our series, Starting Small Holding. In our next programme, we'll deal with those constraints, so don't feel overwhelmed. Come back and join us. We'll give you some tools and some flexible options so you can pursue that dream of a life in the country. If you've enjoyed today's video, can you spare us five seconds? Give us a thumbs up down below. And please, leave us a comment. Tell us what else you'd like to see in this series or what else you'd like to see about the self-sufficient life in general. We really do love to hear from you. If you'd like to see the future videos, hit the subscribe button, the bell next to it, and you'll hear every time we upload new content. Thanks for watching and we look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.